Hello, it is time for chapter 14 of The Book Scavenger. This is what Edgar Allan Poe and Julius Caesar had in common. They were both fans of the monoalphabetic substitution cipher. Emily desperately hoped the bell would ring or someone would pull the alarm as she watched Mr. Quislings transcribe the note. She couldn't even bring herself to look at James. Julius Caesar developed one of the earliest substitution ciphers, Mr. Quisling said. Today we call it the Caesar Shift. Edgar Allan Poe was not only a famous writer, but also a cipher enthusiast. So enthusiastic, in fact, he organized a cipher challenge when he was the editor of a literary magazine. He claimed he could solve any cipher submitted. Despite herself, Emily found this interesting. It made sense, really, since his story, The Gold Bug, included ciphers. She resumed cringing in horror once Mr. Quisling finished copying James's note. Ready? Get out your cipher thing if you still have that. N-T-D-H-U space V-K-U space O-U-D space B-S space I-X-P-V period. B space E-T-F space V-K-B-F-O space XI space VKPUU period. Mr. Quisling tapped the whiteboard. What we have here is called a cipher text. When decoding a secret message like this, letter frequency analysis is a good place to start. Starting on the far left of the whiteboard, Mr. Quisling wrote out the standard alphabet. He was almost jogging as he scribbled his stubby capital letters. He's enjoying this, Emily thought. He's enjoying this, Emily thought. He is, he's enjoying humiliating her. James intently studied the pencil he rolled back and forth under his fingertips. Ciphers play an interesting role in the history of our world. Battles have been won and lost because of them. Assassinations have been diverted because coded plots were intercepted and deciphered. Or conversely, assassinations have been successful. The twists and turns history has taken have often relied on secret messages and whether those messages were able to remain secrets. Jose raised his hand. Are you sure we should be doing this, breaking this code? Emily gave Jose a small smile of gratitude, but his interjection didn't deter Mr. Quisling. Your syllabus plainly states that passing notes or doing any work other than classwork is done to your own risk. Mr. Quisling waved to the board behind him. This is what you risk. If Miss Crane were plotting an assassination, Let's see how we'd fare in diverting the course of history. Using the alphabet he'd written on the board, Mr. Quisling drew a harsh mark under a letter for each time it appeared in James's message. The three most common letters in the English language are E, T, and A. By looking at our frequency chart, we see that U is being used five times in this message, V four times, and K and B three times. It's highly likely at least one of these letters represents E, T, or A. But which is it? Which? This was the same tactic the car character had used to solve the secret message in Poe's story. Let's look at our three-letter words, V, K, U, O, U, D, and E, T, F. Mr. Quisling stood back and rubbed his chin. He circled the V, K in V, K, U. The T, H combination found in T, H, E is commonly found at the beginning of other words. In this message, you see VK is also used in VKBFO and VKPUU. This might suggest that the V equals T and K equals H, making VKU equal the. Let's go with that and see what happens. Mr. Quisling filled in letters of the message like a game of hangman. Students began calling out guesses for the words. Before Emily knew it, Mr. Quisling and her social studies class had cracked James's message. Maybe the key is fort. I can think of three. Assassination diverted, Mr. Quisling cried. Emily's face burned so furiously, she thought her eyes might act like magnifying glasses in the sun and set her binder paper on fire. At least James hadn't mentioned Mr. Griswold or his game in his note. A student called out, it doesn't make sense. Another said, maybe it's supposed to read fart and laughter filled the room. Mr. Quisling clapped his hands and shouted, enough. The laughter sputtered until a boy stage whispered, the three farts of Christmas past, present, and future. James joined in the renewed titters, 
but the tips of his ears looked suddenly sunburned. Mr. Quisling paced the aisles for so long, the laughter faded into suppressed giggles, then uneasy silence and shifting in seats. Emily ran her finger around the diamond carved onto her desktop, avoiding eye contact and hoping no more humiliation was in store. Mr. Quisling smacked the desk of a girl who yelped in surprise. I propose a challenge, Mr. Quisling proclaimed, a cipher challenge in the spirit of Edgar Allan Poe. Here's how it will work. You may submit substitution ciphers to the class, one cipher per student per week. You can turn in your first ones tomorrow, which is Wednesday, if you wish. After this week, Monday will be the day to submit ciphers. The class will have the week to attempt to break the submitted ciphers. Any ciphers left standing by the end of the week will earn you a free homework pass to use on any assignment this semester. You may earn a maximum of three homework passes. Chatter and excitement permeated the classroom. Don't lose your heads, people, Mr. Quisling bellowed over the din. Be prepared to explain your cipher for the class if it goes unbroken in order to, provo or order to prove it's validly constructed. The bell rang and above the scraping chairs and zipping backpacks, Mr. Quisling shouted, Bring enough copies for the whole class. As people filed out of the room, Mr. Quisling tapped papers into an even pile on his desk. Without looking up, he said, starting off on a bad foot, Emily Crane, do better tomorrow. Emily nodded obediently, even though Mr. Quisling wasn't looking at her. You aren't mad at me, are you? She asked James in the hallway. Mad at you, James said. You should be mad at me. It was stupid to pass the note in the first place. At least this cipher challenge sounds cool. Don't get too excited. Maddie stepped away from the lockers like she'd been waiting for them. Your cute little code was broken like that. She snapped her fingers. I doubt you'll win any homework passes. And you will, James asked. Maddie smirked. How about a side bet? Whoever owns the mo earns the most homework passes or gets to three first wins. James rolled his eyes. It's always about winning with you, isn't it? It's only worth doing if there's a ribbon in it. For the briefest moment, Maddie winced, but with a shake of her motionless hair, she said, sounds like someone who's afraid of losing. I'm not afraid of losing. Are you afraid of losing, Steve? James tilted his head to the side as if he were listening to his cowlick's reply. What's in it for the winner? Emily interjected. Maddie's calculating smile took on a slightly evil cast. Maybe it's not about what we win, but what the other has to lose. What does that mean? Emily asked. Maddie moved two fingers like alligator jaws across James's hair. If you lose, you have to shave off that stupid tuft of hair you treat like an imaginary friend. And just that, I want a bald spot in its place. Emily sucked in a breath. Not Steve, she thought. She'd grown attached to the spiky guy, but James didn't look worried. And if you lose, he asked, will you shave your head? It was clear from Maddie's expression she hadn't considered the flip side of his wager. You can dye it, Emily blurted out, red with polka dots like a toadstool. James bit his lip to keep from laughing. Like I'm doing that, Maddie said. It's better than having to shave your part of your head, James said. Way better, Emily added. You can wash the color out the same day. James will have to wait weeks for his to grow back. James held up his hands. Hey, I understand if you're worried you can't beat me. Fine, Maddie held out her hand to shake. Start planning a farewell party for Stan. It's Steve, James called to Maddie's retreating back. And the only thing he'll say farewell to is your brown hair when you have to dye it red. On their way back to their building after school, Emily and James walked through the stretch of shops and restaurants that surrounded Hollister's bookstore. A coffee shop, a fancy restaurant, an old movie theater converted into a fitness center, a dry cleaner, another coffee shop, a clothing boutique, a sushi restaurant, and so on. All these businesses were on the ground level of buildings with floors of apartments above. There was more activity squished into these few blocks than the entire New Mexico town Emily had left behind. What's Maddie's problem anyway, Emily asked. She and James broke apart for three women with yoga mats slung on their shoulders and then came back together. James shrugged. She thinks she's better than everybody. Good old mop top Maddie Fernandez. Not that I'm one to talk about distinctive hairstyles, of course. I thought her hair looked more like a mushroom cap than a mop, Emily said. James snorted. <laughs> a mushroom? Is that why you came up with the toadstool look if she loses? 
Why didn't I see that before? He looked at Emily shyly. She's an evil mushroom queen. Her royal fungus, Emily suggested, and they cracked up. Three adults waiting at a bus stop eyed them suspiciously. James clamped a hand over his mouth and Emily straightened her posture. But their attempts to look serious just made them break down in laughter even more. On Wednesday, almost the entire social studies class submitted ciphers for Mr. Quisling's challenge. On Thursday, every last cipher had been cracked, including James's, Maddie's, and Emily's. What did I get myself into, James moaned as they walked after school Thursday afternoon. I can't believe all the ciphers were broken. This is gonna be way harder than I thought. I don't wanna shave off Steve. Don't worry, her royal fungus is struggling with the challenge too. You're not losing to her yet. Emphasis on yet, James said. Emily bumped her backpack against his. You're a puzzle master. You've got this and I'll help you out. Not that I'll be much help seeing as I've made zero progress with Mr. Griswold's secret message. Have you tried talking to Raven again? Yeah, she wouldn't reply until yesterday and then all I got was, I don't have the information you seek. I wish I could stop by Bayside Press and snoop for information about the game. James stopped walking. He stared absentmindedly at a window washer on a platform dangling outside an apartment building. Well, why can't we? Emily looked from the window washer to James, confused. Visit Bayside Press, James said. It can't hurt to try, right? Ooh, do you think they're gonna do the window washer? No posts needed today.